You may be in order. Uh, today we are uh, going to hear testimony concerning H.R. 527, the Judiciary Small Business Regulatory Flexible, Flexibility Improvements Act of 2011. Uh, also, the Regulatory Accountability Act of 2011, H.R. 3010, and then H.R. 3463 from House Administration and Ways and Means to reduce the federal spending and deficit by terminating taxpayer financed and presidential election campaigns and party conventions and by terminating the Elections Assistance Commission. Uh, I want to welcome our two members from the Judiciary Committee who are here to give testimony. The gentlewoman, Mrs. Slaughter, has indicated she does not wish to have an opening statement. Are there any other members that wish to make an opening statement before we begin? I want to thank the gentleman, uh, Mr. Gowdy, uh, and also Mr. Cohen, for being here, and uh, would like to yield them such time as they would choose to give with the understanding that uh, we will accept their uh, testimony uh, if they want to give us anything written, and we'll put that into the record. Uh, we also would like to ask that uh, Mr. Cohen and Mr. Gowdy talk on both these bills as they choose to. Gentlemen, Mr. Gowdy is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to take this uh, opportunity to testify today, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify regarding H.R. 3010, the Regulatory Accountability Act of 2011, and H.R. 527, the Regulatory Flexibility Improvement Act, H.R. 3010, Mr. Chairman, was introduced by Mr. Coble of North Carolina, Mr. Peterson of Minnesota, and Mr. Smith of Texas. It is co-sponsored by numerous members from both sides of the aisle and has bipartisan companion legislation in the Senate. H.R. 527 was introduced by Mr. Coble, Small Business Committee Chairman Graves, and Mr. Smith of Texas. It is modeled on bipartisan legislation from the 109th Congress. Both of these bills take strong measures to fix the problem of regulations that overreach and impose excessive costs on, on America's job creators. H.R. 3010 amends the Administrative Procedure Act to include strong cost-benefit, transparency, and accountability requirements. Under the legislation's common-sense provisions, agencies are required to assess the cost and benefits of regulatory alternatives. Unless interests of public health, safety, or welfare require otherwise, Agencies must adopt the least costly alternative that achieves the regulatory objective Congress has established. The bill also increases the transparency of the rulemaking process with more advanced notices of proposed rulemaking, more opportunities for public comment, and more opportunities for public hearings. This will lessen the influence of all special interests. H.R. 527 amends the Regulatory Flexibility Act and the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act to curb cost and overreach. It closes loopholes in these laws, which ensures that agencies will fully account for the effects of new regulations on small businesses before they adopt them. Also, H.R. 527 strengthens requirements that agencies review and improve existing regulations to lower the burden on small business. It also enhances the business, the Small Business Administration's ability to comment on and help shape Major rules assures uniform implementation of the law across a all agencies and improves judicial review. Mr. Chairman, both pieces of legislation are urgently needed. Employers across America face an avalanche of unnecessary federal regulatory cost. Federal regulations cost our economy $1.75 trillion each year. The current administration seeks to add billions more to the cost, which further threatens job creation and growth. The administration's record-setting issuance of major regulations is particularly troublesome. According to the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, the administration's 2000, 2011 regulatory agenda contains 200 regulations that typically will impact the economy by more than $100 million per year. In a recent Gallup poll, Mr. Chairman, conducted just last month, nearly one-quarter of small business owners cite compliance with government regulations as their primary concern. That should motivate all of us to want to take action. What enables the administration to issue so many new regulations with so little regard for their cost is the outdated Administrative Procedure Act en enacted in 1946. The APA's minimal limitations on rulemaking have hardly changed in decades and do nothing to control cost. Similarly, it is the loopholes in the Regulatory Flexibility Act and the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act that allow the administration to impose many unnecessary costs on small businesses. The Regulatory Accountability Act and the Regulatory Flexibility Improvements Act provide a great opportunity for Republicans and Democrats alike to join together and lower the job-killing cost of regulation. And the two bills allow costs to be lowered while assuring that all of Congress's regulatory objectives are obtained. 
These bills also provide a clear opportunity for Congress to match the President's own words on regulatory reform. In a State of the Union address, the President said that to reduce barriers to growth and investment, when we find rules that put an unnecessary burden on businesses, we will fix them. In Executive Order 13563, the President said our regulatory system must promote economic growth, innovation, competitiveness, and job creation, must allow for public participation and an open exchange of ideas, must identify and use the best, most innovative, and least burdensome tools for achieving regulatory ends, and must take into account cost and benefits. These bills simply put the President's words into legislative action. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, in January, uh, in a January 18, 2011 presidential memorandum, President Obama said that agencies should give serious consideration to whether and how it is appropriate, consistent with law and regulatory objectives, to reduce regulatory burdens on small businesses through increased flexibility. The President was right, Mr. Chairman, and H.R. 3010 and H.R. 527 follow up on those statements. It's time to cut the regulatory red tape that too often ties up small businesses and job creators. I request the Rules Committee grant appropriate rules that allow for prompt consideration of H.R. 3010 and H.R. 527. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gowdy, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Cohen? Thank you, Mr. Chairman Sessions. The, uh, I have had two statements that are on, on the different bills, and the first one concerns H.R. 527. Uh, we object, they'll be entered the record. Thank you. Small businesses indeed play a major role in our nation's economy, especially during recessionary times. They are indeed drivers of innovation and economic growth. They are among our nation's principal employers and have been uh, firms of uh, fewer than 500 workers have employed over half of the private sector workers since 19, 2006. What is interesting to note, though, is that both of these facts have been true under the existing regulatory system that has been in place since 1980 when the Regulatory Flexibility Act was enacted. And they've continued to be true since 1996, which is when the Regulatory Flexibility Act was amended by the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act. While the proponents of H.R. 527 argue that the RFA has been ineffective at stemming overbearing regulations that stifle, quote, unquote, small businesses, the fact is small businesses have done generally well in the 31 years since that act became law. Another fact is that H.R. 527 is a solution in search of a problem. During a hearing on this bill before the Committee on Courts, Commercial, and Administrative Law, the three majority witnesses all cited the same study, a study by Nicole and Mark Crane, that claims that federal rulemaking imposes a cumulative cost of $1.75 trillion on the nation's economy. That's rather thrilling, thr chilling. The Nonpartisan Congressional Research Service among others, however, thoroughly debunked the study. The uh, CRS noted that the Crane study did not account for any benefits of regulation and that it used suspect methodology to reach its conclusions. But as this seriously flawed study, the proponents of H.R. 527 primarily, if not exclusively, relied upon to support their legislation. While there is no dispute that regulations can impose costs and a cost-benefit analysis is a valuable tool for ensuring that agencies promulgate good regulations, there is no evidence substantiating the purported impact of regulatory cost on small businesses. Another faulty premise that supporters of 527 cite is the notion that federal regulations somehow eliminate incentives to hire workers. Again, however, there's no credible evidence substantiating that assertion. If anything, there is undisputable correlation between the lack of regulation in recent years and our nation's fiscal distress and result in employment troubles. You know, there were some problems with regulation of the financial institutions and the banks and some of the folks that caused us to almost go into a deep recession. In fact, they did. In particular, that so-called Great Recession and ongoing home foreclosure crisis are products of that failure to adequately regulate the financial services and housing industries. While almost anything can stand to be improved, H.R. 527 makes drastic changes to current law that may very well undermine the ability of agencies to protect American people from a broad range of harms, including ensuring their public safety and their public health. One example is, is clear. H.R. 527 substantially expands the use of small business review panels, which were, were originally required by the Small Business Review uh, Act. Under current law, these review panels analyze proposed rules by various agencies, including EPA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, that may have significant economic impact on a substantial number of small entities. H.R. 527 expands the review panel requirement to include rules issued by all agencies as well as all major rules, regardless of whether they have a significant economic impact 
on a substantial number of small entities. The cost and delays that will result from this requirement will substantially delay and possibly halt the rulemaking process. Another serious problem with the bill is that it requires agencies to consider the indirect effect of a proposed or final rule. Now, I'd ask you to consider what is an indirect effect. This new requirement will force agencies to engage in highly speculative and potentially endless analysis, which again will result in cost and delay in rulemaking. The cost of government will indeed increase. Perhaps the most problematic aspect of the bill is its provisions that repeal the authority of agencies to waive or delay their regulatory flexibility analysis in the event of an emergency. An emergency. If we're truly concerned about flexibility in the rulemaking process, then at a minimum, agencies ought to at least retain the ability to respond in emergencies. The bottom line is that H.R. 527 threatens agencies' abilities to issue rules that ensure the safety of the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, the products we buy, the places we work, rules that most Americans support. We all remember spinach. We all remember lettuce. We've all had problems, and OSHA has, uh, and EPA has protected us, and the, and the Clean Water Act has as well. This is why I filed an amendment that would exempt from H.R. 527 all rules relating to food safety, workplace safety, consumer product safety, air quality, and water quality. I hope you share my concerns about the bill and accordingly consider that amendment. In sum, I want to help small businesses excel in meaningful ways, especially in these difficult economic times, but H.R. 527 is simply the wrong answer. Regarding uh, 3010, it's also a seriously flawed bill, Mr. Chairman. It's based on a faulty premise that regulations kill jobs, result in economically stifling costs, and promote uncertainty. As to the impact of regulations on job creation, there's not been a single shred of evidence presented over the course of five Judiciary Committee hearings on the regulatory process that this bill or any of the other bills will create a single job. In fact, the majority's own witness, Christopher DeMuth, who appeared on behalf of the conservative think tank American Enterprise Institute, clearly debunked this argument. He said, quote, the focus on jobs can lead to confusion and regulatory debate, and that the employment effects of regulation, quote, are indeterminate, unquote. With respect to the purported cost of regulations, the proponents tirelessly cite the so-called Crane Study, debunked by many. The, the C Congressional Research Service, the Center for Progressive Reform, and the Economic Policy Institute found the study to have been based on incomplete and irrelevant data. Another argument that regulatory uncertainty hurts business has similarly been debunked, and been debunked by Bruce Bartlett, a senior policy analyst in the, both the Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations, who observed, and I quote Mr. Bartlett, Regulatory uncertainty is a canard invented by Republicans that allows them to use current economic problems to pursue an agenda supported by the business community year in and year out. In other words, it is a simple case of political opportunism, not a serious effort to deal with high unemployment, unquote. As a direct result of the bill's cumbersome, litigation-intensive, and time-consuming provisions, H.R. 3010 will create more, not less, uncertainty as businesses and others in the private sector await the finalization of rules. Perhaps most importantly, I'm very concerned that H.R. 3010 will have a pernicious effect on the public health and well-being of Americans. The ways in which bill, this bill does these things are almost too numerous to list here, but I'll mention a few. H.R. 3010 would override critical laws that prohibit agencies from considering costs when public health and safety are at stake. Public health and safety, two of the police powers. These statutes include, include the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act. I, I, I think President uh, Nixon had something to do with one or both, and the Occupational Safety and Health Act. This means that agency officials will now be required to balance the cost of an air pollution standard with the cost of how many anticipated lives and illnesses that will result in the absence of such regulations. I have many constituents and friends with uh, asthma problems, the lung problems, uh, whose lives may be one of the 2,000 that will be lost as an estimate on some of these bills that we're passing where the EPA standards are changed. As our witnesses testified earlier this month of H.R. 3010 were in effect in the 1970s, the government quote, almost certainly would not have required the removal of most lead from gasoline until perhaps decades later. Another problem with the bill that puts Americans at risk is the delay that will result from numerous procedural hurdles that the bill imposes on the rulemaking process, a process that most experts agree is already too ossified. The bill adds roughly 60 additional analytical requirements to the already substantial analytical process, which threatens paralysis by analysis. Worse yet, some of these new requirements have been soundly rejected by respected administrative law, academicians and practitioners, such as the bill's mandate requiring formal rulemaking. As a leading administrative law professor testified earlier this month before our Judiciary Committee, quote, almost no serious administrative law experts regard formal rulemaking as reasonable, and it has all but been regulated to the dustbin of history. 
This explains why more than 50 leading administrative law academicians and practitioners, as well as the American Bar Association, have raised serious concerns about these new requirements. Regulations that promote the health of our citizens and ensure the safety of American-made products will unquestionably lead to job creation and protect the competitiveness of our businesses in the global marketplace. I note that a number of common sense amendments have been filed that would provide some relief from the impact of the bill's super mandate and help protect Americans' lives, which I hope will be favorably considered by this committee. And I'm particularly troubled that many provisions of the bill will facilitate greater influence of business interests on rulemaking and agencies. We already know the ability of corporate and business interests to influence, to influence uh, agency rulemaking that far exceeds that by groups representing the general public. And the bottom line for business is profits. The bottom line of this Congress should be lives and safety of our citizens. But rather than leveling the ac access playing field, H.R. 3010 will further tip the balance in favor of business interests by giving them multiple opportunities to influence and defeat the rulemaking process. The American people simply deserve better. Mr. Gatty, Ms. Cohen, thank you very much for your testimony related to uh, H.R. 527 and H.R. 3010. The uh, chair has a question for the gentleman, Mr. Cohen, and I will paraphrase this, but the gentleman, Mr. Gowdy, uh, spoke about President Obama addressing this issue of uh, regulatory oversight and how uh, re regulatory oversight has perhaps some impact on jobs, job creation, and some balance that takes place. And the President has addressed this. Mr. Cohen, you spoke about the notion of regulatory oversight that on business that could not be substantiated as you talked about H.R. 527. What was the President in reference to then when the President spoke about seeing a problem, do you think? Um, while I'm a strong supporter of the President and proudly cast a vote for him at the Democratic National Convention and plan to do so again, I cannot read his mind, and sometimes he does things that even puzzles his supporters. So you're perhaps clueless on what the president was in reference to because your testimony I would not said, say that I was clueless on any matter at any time, but I am not aware of what the president Not aware of. Yes. What his right. Thank you very much. Mrs. Fox? I have breaking news. I have been informed that the administration has issued a statement that they are opposing both bills. Yes. Breaking news seems to be the current. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Fox. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to um, thank these two gentlemen for being here today and making their presentations. Um, I am very concerned that we um, do mu many things to reform uh, the APA and to um, bring it more in line with um, the realities that we face in our country. Uh, I don't think making the changes that are anticipated here are going to create the kinds of problems that have been uh, brought up by our colleagues on the other side of the aisle. I, Mr. Cohen and I are classmates and good friends, and um, I respect him a lot, but um, I think that the regulations as we currently have them in most cases do more harm than good and it's long past time for us to make changes that need to be made and I appreciate what you all have done and I don't have any questions Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Slaughter. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank you gentlemen for yes, coming. Uh, I would like to ask unanimous consent to put the statement of the administration policy in the objection. record. And would like to, to quote from it so that people will know what he's saying over there, which I think will be no surprise. Uh, the administration is committed to ensuring regulations are smart and effective, that they are tailored to advance statutory goals in the most cost-effective and efficient manner, and that they minimize uncertainty. Accordingly, the administration strongly opposes House passage of H.R. 3010. The Regulatory Accountability Act would impose unprecedented procedural requirements on agencies that would prevent them from performing their statutory responsibilities. It would also create needless regulatory and legal uncertainty and increased costs for businesses, as well as state, tribal, and local governments, and further impede the implementation of common sense protections for the American public. The Regulatory Accountability Act would impose unnecessary new procedures on agencies and invite frivolous litigation. When a federal agency promulgates a regulation, it must already adhere 
to the requirements of the statute that is implementing. In many cases, Congress has mandated that the agency issue a particular rule or regulation, and it often prescribes the agents, what the rules the agency must follow. Agencies already have to comply with the Administrative Procedure Act, uh, major uh, rules that are subject to the requirements of other federal statutes, such as the Regulatory Flexibility Act, the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act, and the Paperwork Reduction Act. In addition, for decades, agency rulemaking has been governed by executive orders issued and followed by administrations of both political parties. In other words, they think we are impinging on their territory. Passage of H.R. 3020 would replace this time-honored framework with layers of additional procedural requirements that would seriously undermine the ability of agencies to execute their mandates. It would require cumbersome formal rulemaking for a new category of rules for which agencies would have to conduct quasi-adjudicatory proceedings. It would impose unnecessary new evidentiary standards as a condition of rulemaking. It would subject the regulatory process to unneeded rounds of litigation. Finally, it would undermine the executive branch's ability to adapt regulatory review to changing circumstances. So, if it should pass, and I think probably we all know that we're probably doing another one-house bill here today, uh, the uh, senior advisors to the president would recommend his veto. I have no questions. Thank you very much, you. Uh, Mr. Bishop. Mr. McGovern. Yeah, I just have a, I just have a couple of quick questions. Um, why why aren't there exemptions in this bill uh, in cases where there's a threat to you know clean air and clean water? Why not allow amendments to exempt rules that protect the public health and safety? Is there a reason for that? I thought there was, if the gentleman will give me a moment to consult with someone who's more knowledgeable than I am on that, I think I could get you a better answer. Uh, sir, the agency does not have to take the cheapest alternative. They can, in some instances, take the most, uh, the costliest alternative if they can prove that that benefit, that meeting the statutory mission, can only be done that way. So the notion that you have to take the cheapest of all alternatives, um, you, you don't have to. No. And, I, and I appreciate that, but I, I, would, I would, my guess is that um, if this bill would have passed, it will open up if an agency were to take a more expensive route because they claim that it's in the health of the well or the breaking the health of the American people in some way, I, I could I, I would expect lots and lots of challenges, you know, from special interests that uh, are against the rule uh, because it's in their financial interest. I'm, 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 HR 3010, as I understand it. Um, Requi requires that agencies and courts consider the business and regulatory environments of other nations as part of their, uh, you know, criteria, which w when I read that, it, 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 I get worried that we're kind of, we're laying the groundwork for kind of a global regulatory race to the bottom, which means, for example, if we were to adopt, um, you know, uh, if, if we were to have, if we, it would, it would it force us to adopt weaker clean water and clean air standards simply because China has lousy clean water and clean air standards. And I think what worries me most about all this is that it, it, I really do, I worry that this is, is encouraging a, a, a race to the bottom in terms of the very rules and regulations that protect people's health and their safety. And um, so I'm, I'm very concerned about that. I would, uh, uh, I, I, would, I, would I would also ask, well, Maybe the chairman of the uh, of the rules committee. Uh, when are we going to when are we going to consider bills that are going to actually create some jobs? Um, I, I don't think anybody believes that this is going to create any jobs. Uh, uh, and and I would just say, going back to what you said, you asked a question to Mr. Cohen about uh, the president's uh, commitment to eliminate uh, excessive regulation. I think what the president had in mind is a, a thoughtful process, which would go by and see whether there's duplication or triplication. Or you know, or maybe there are areas where we need to loosen up certain regulations, but uh, but not this kind of a you know approach to this. So when are we going to when are we going to deal with something that's going to 
put some of my constituents to work. Good. Gentleman Yield? Yes, I'm happy to. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as the gentleman has been aware, as he has uh, sat through, I believe, almost all of our hearings during the year, the Republican majority has had a number of jobs bills which have been passed. Uh, the bottom line is this Congress is all about creating jobs. Uh, and what we have done is we have passed uh, a, a number of bills that include uh, making sure that we look at energy, that we look at uh, production of cement, that we have looked at uh, uh, regulations that are on each of these industries, including small business. And time after time after time, this committee has held not only hearings, but this House has passed bills that are about energy production that would gain, uh, as testimony has been given, $1 trillion worth of GDP and 1 million jobs. Uh, we have had the Energy and Commerce Committee here. We've had Judiciary Committee here. We've had Ways and Means here. Uh, we are talking about rules and regulations uh, and taxation. Uh, the very first bill, one of the first bills that we talked about was uh, repealing, and it was passed by the House of Representatives, repealing the health care bill, which will uh, cause, which has caused a tremendous uh, a downturn of the economy as a result of uncertainty in the marketplace. Uh, we have had bills that the gentleman, Mr. Polis, has taken plate, has spoken on behalf of, of entrepreneurship. Uh, and bills which create opportunities for entrepreneurs to be able to make uh, investments. Uh, we just handled that two weeks ago. So the gentleman should be aware, uh, and I'll be pleased to give him an, an exhaustive list of the bills that this Rules Committee has had based upon regular order in the House of Representatives that have, has taken place through committee uh, to this uh, Rules Committee and then to the floor of the House of Representatives. Well, I believe that they are stacking up. Uh, in the Senate, and there's been no action taken. Will the gentleman yield for a moment? I yield to the gentleman. Uh, since the chair, uh, the chair addressed some remarks, I, I believe were in reference to the, the crowdsourcing bill and, and uh, the accompanying bill that allowed uh, better allowed startup companies to raise capital from other than qualified investors uh, in the case of the one bill and, and from indiv small individual investors in the other bill. Um, certainly those bills have the potential in the long term to create jobs in startup and growth companies. The issue is they do nothing in the short term. By the time those bills are through and the rules and regs are passed, uh, we'll probably be about a year to a year to a half down the road. So, I, again, I think it's great. And, you know, 2014, some startups will be funded that way. By 2016, many of those startups could very well employ tens of thousands of people. But uh, what they don't address is uh, this crisis uh, of employment uh, and unemployment that we have in this country. And, Many of my constituents, and I know uh, the gentleman from Texas is as well, who, um, who, who are really looking for work now. Uh, and while we all will benefit in the long term from better economy, uh, I, think it's also, I also think it's necessary for this Congress to address jobs over the next 12 months. No, I, I, I thank the gentleman. I'll just say to the, my friend from Texas, my, he just went through a list that uh, I'll tell you uh, my colleagues are, my, my, my constituents back in Massachusetts aren't, aren't impressed. It's not putting anybody to work. I mean, what, I just came from an event this morning where people are wondering, why, why can't we get a, a highway reauthorization bill passed? And we got bridges in Massachusetts that are older than some of your states. Um, and, it cost, and, it, and it's expensive to repair them. They have to be repaired. Repair them, you put people back to work. You know, where we, 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 we deal with issues like uh, reaffirming the in God we trust as our national motto and uh, making it easy to carry concealed weapons from state to state. Uh, meanwhile, you get millions of people that are unemployed. They're looking for Congress to actually do something meaningful. And I, you know, I, I respect everybody who's here, but I don't really think this is going to do anything uh, meaningful to put people back to work. And uh, you know, economist after economist have said that this is not the this is not the the problem in terms of job creation here. Uh, and yet, I think we're we're wasting our time on things like this when we should be, quite frankly, considering the president's jobs bill, you know, or something bolder to, to get people back to work now. Uh, you know, people don't want to wait two years or three years for a job. They need a job right now. So um, I thank the gentleman for giving me the time. But I, I, this to me is, uh, this, this is not what our constituents want. Gentleman, yield. Yeah, happy to yield. Uh, in testimony two weeks ago, there was a good bit of uh, discussion about who was losing their jobs with the health care bill. And a number of, of uh, people spoke about it being the 
uh, public sector that is losing jobs uh, as a result of the health care bill and cities that are having problems employing people. Uh, I think that it is important for us to recognize that we, meaning the majority, is interested in working on the issues of trying to resolve public and private sector employment. And uh, the testimony that was given last week, or two weeks ago, directly pointed to the health care bill as a cause or one of the causes for many jobs to be lost in this country. Testimony and, by whom? Uh, it was before this committee, and I'll be glad to get that to yeah, you. No, I mean, the, yeah, the number of jobs was, that were all, being lost. First of all, public sector, sector jobs are just as important as private sector jobs. That's exactly jobs. what I'm trying and to suggest and, and where we're losing public sector jobs, quite frankly, is in areas like law enforcement, our police departments, our fire departments. Absolutely. Because, you know, communities don't have the funds uh, to be able to, you know, to be able to, uh, you know, provide for the resources to pay for them. That because of the that, uncertainty that, in the marketplace. That, no, I'll tell you what the uncertainty is, is the fact that, you know, the, the Republican majority in this House forces these two-month or three-month uh, extensions of uh, continuing resolutions that do not give communities the ability to be able to plan. And, you know, my suggestion to the leadership in this House is that rather than holding the entire country hostage, these little tiny CRs every once in a while, we ought to be thinking long term about a six year highway reauthorization bill so our communities, whether it's in Massachusetts or Texas or wherever, can actually plan, invest in our infrastructure, and put people back to work. And so I, uh, you know, that, that's my point. I mean, you know, I spoke to a group this morning in Massachusetts. The big question was when are we going to get a highway bill? And what is it going to look like? Is it going to be six years? I mean, th th that's what they were talking about. These are businesses. We weren't talking about this stuff, and with that, I yield back. Joe, and yields his time, I would uh, remind the gentleman that this uh, Republican uh, majority in the House has uh, handled a budget, and we've been over 900 days without a budget being presented to us by the United well, States just, Senate. We, we have one, more, and, one more point, if I could? The, uh, the gentleman would be allowed that yeah. time. I just want to remind the gentleman, you know, um, it was the Ryan budget, you know, that cut money for police, to cut money for teachers, to cut money for fire departments, to cut money for, quite frankly, for a lot of, a lot of initiatives that would, that would protect jobs and create jobs. So, you know, the, I think what I'm saying is that the leadership in this House, you know, ought to rethink their position. And given the difficult state the economy is in, you know, work with the President, work with the Senate, try to get something done to put people back to work. And I thank the gentleman for the Gentleman, yields time. Mr. Woodall? I thank the Chairman. And I appreciate my freshman colleague from South Carolina joining us today. I, I want to, to ask you, because even if you have more knowledgeable people behind you, you're more knowledgeable than I am on these, these issues. Uh, my friend from Massachusetts just said that this bill is going to do nothing uh, to hire more uh, firemen with federal dollars, to hire more uh, policemen with federal dollars, to hire more uh, teachers with federal dollars. Is that your understanding as well? Um. Well, that's, a, that's at least a three-part question, if you'll allow me to answer it. Um, I, I have to start with the President's own words from the, the, the joint address that he gave, which is we should have no more regulation than is necessary for the health, safety, and security of the American public. That, that's not a Republican presidential candidate talking. That's the President of the United States. Uh, Cass Sunstein, um, who um, is not a noted conservative, uh, said almost the exact same thing the last time he appeared before oversight. So the notion that there's no connection between a regulatory apparatus that stifles job creation and jobs um, is uh, disconnected at best. I can tell you anecdotally, uh, Congressman, every job uh, plant tour that I go on back in South Carolina, the one word that occurs more often than any other is uncertainty. We don't know what's coming next from Washington, whether it's health care, whether it's cap and trade, whether it's card check. I'm not even going to get into the NLRB. I would just say uh, there may be people who are tied with me in terms of their affection for law enforcement and teachers, but I don't know that there's anyone who surpasses me. I'm married to a teacher. I was a prosecutor for 16 years. Uh, you can have an argument that those are decidedly state and local functions. And uh, to the extent that the state um, isn't funding education or public safety to, to the extent that it should be, 
uh, going to an entity that is $15 trillion in debt for the solution um, doesn't seem to me to be much of a solution. The, I don't even think we have an argument about whether those things are decidedly uh, state-based. Uh, uh, they are, in fact, decidedly uh, state-based. And I, I do worry about why our, community, our communities don't have the funds they need to do those things uh, themselves. Uh, Mr. Cohen, you referenced that you thought this bill tilted the scales in favor of, of business. Um, I'm trying to think of what pools of money our local communities have to draw on to meet those needs that Mr. McGovern suggested. Uh, in my community, uh, we're losing business. And when we lose business, we lose local revenues, and we have to lay off the very people that my friend from Massachusetts con is concerned about. Do you see that as a, as a net negative in these tough economic times to, to tilt the scale in favor of those people who create the jobs? Because I, I agree with my friend from Massachusetts. That's why we're all here. Well, we all are here for that reason, sir, and you're right. But I think what's happened is a, it's a bigger macro picture about the destruction of the middle class and how with the Bush tax cuts and other things that we've got this upper 1% and then we've got the rest of the world. And when you don't have a middle class, you can't have consumers. And no matter what the quote-unquote job creators do, if there's not people out there willing and able to buy the product, mm -hmm. you're going to have an economic collapse. States depend on sales tax, basically, to fund these services. And so if they're not making sales of goods, you're not going to be able to create the tax revenue for the policemen and the firemen. And, and while I understand Mr. Gowdy's position and your position, much of the law enforcement money you get in, in all states, it's, it's burn center grants, it's monies from the federal government that come in and support the police and the fire already. Much of that money is your roads are mostly paid for by the federal government. Your ports are, your airports, the FAA, everything. And while it might create uncertainty, business might not like uncertainty, I think they like certainty when they get on an airplane and they know that somebody has been competent to fix, to be the mechanic to make sure that plane goes up and comes down at the proper time and place. You know, I, I have to disagree with Mr. McGovern a little bit on his statement to say this bill is not going to create any jobs. I think it will create some jobs. I was thinking about, you know, doctors and nurses for the people that have emphysema and get lung disease and have to go to the hospitals. I was thinking about the rehabilitation specialists for people at OSHA when you, you have problems, you may lose an arm or you might hurt, hurt your Reclaiming my brain time from my friend. I mean, I, 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 I tell folks back home, and you can, you can look at any town hall meeting I've had, I tell them I have more in common with a Democrat from Tennessee than do a Republican from California because so many of the issues we talk about are, are regional issues. They're jobs issues, they're, they're, they're uh, issues of philosophy, issues of, of community, and, and we have so much in common as, as neighboring states. But it is, it's those kinds of statements, I think, that, that it, it's tough to argue uh, add anything to the to the discourse. I mean, let, let's have the vote on the House floor about who it is that supports more folks having their arms cut off. I mean, do you believe that there's going to be a single yes vote? No, and that is not what this bill is about. Do, well, I'm, let me ask you that, because I, I've gotten to know my freshman colleague well uh, from South Carolina. Do you believe that Mr. Gowdy would bring a bill to the floor that I, would result, that, that would be designed to, to end up with more of the kinds of casualties that you've discussed? Not intentionally, no. not knowingly, of course. And just like we have a disagreement on maybe on tort reform, because I think that, that a tort, tort suits do make the conduct of business interests and physicians and others more careful because uh, attorneys can be private attorney generals, and we know that a lot of improvements in, in medical and business practices have come because of tort actions, and so we have a difference. I, I don't think Mr. Gowdy in any way in the world would ever think about the fact that that, that would be the result. But the results that occur are very much down the line, and that's why, you know, it's, it's, it's just you can look at history and you understand what's the eventual result of not having government regulate. The airplane that crashed up in Buffalo and all those people died, well, there was a problem with, with the hours those folks had to rest and the amount of time they had to train and all those things. And training of pilots and rest for pilots and the time is real important, especially to those people that died and their families. Nobody thought about it when they just changed, didn't well, I, have those regulations or want to change. Again, I don't mind relying on folks who are, who are, who are more well studied than I am, but as I have read uh, through the, the committee report, I don't see any language that says we should cease regulation. Could you, I mean, is, is that language here? Because what you're talking about is the benefit of regulation. I don't think there's anyone in this room who would dispute that. What you're describing is what happens if we cease regulating, and I don't think there's anyone who's advocating for that. 
I think the undercurrent, the underlying theme of all of these bills that have been brought on regulation is that there should be less and less regulation and that there should uh, not be the same scrutiny to public safety that the public is used to in food and air and water and products and, and in other areas. And I put the public safety first and paramount. Well, I, I will say to my friend that I, much as, as, as you have said of folks who believe in a, in a less regulatory environment as I do, that we would never support uh, uh, bad uh, outcomes uh, intentionally, but perhaps that's just the just the result of a, of a rush to judgment, I would say to you that I don't believe that you want to put folks in my district out of work. I don't believe in your hearts you want to put folks in my district out of work, but I believe that that is the unintentional un consequence of an unfettered regulatory process. And as, as I read this committee report, what I see is an attempt to have a balanced process, not that a, a process that says don't regulate, but a process that says regulate freely, but with some accountability for what the costs of that regulation uh, will be. I just cannot imagine, even in a group of 435 uh, different uh, constituencies, that there's anyone in this body that does not believe that regulation should be accompanied uh, by a thoughtful analysis of both the benefits, as you have discussed, and the cost, as I have discussed. Do you believe that in this body there are those who just believe we could, should regulate irrespective of the costs and benefits? I'm afraid there are some people that, 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 that think we shouldn't regulate regardless of the benefits. Mm -hmm. There are some people that think that all regulation is bad, and that's basically the, uh, the spirit from which they come. And I, I just disagree. I think we should have speed limits. I think we should have signs at the end of the road that say, dead end, you know, if you, you're going to fall off the cliff, and that, you know, that there are certain regulations that are good. And some people would think it's the market. Sayonara. I will, I will share with my friend, if you've not been down to visit and spend some money in my part of the world, we have both sets of signs uh, in my district, though both were posted without any assistance of the federal government uh, whatsoever. Um, t tell me about the, the $1.75 trillion, uh, Mr. Gowdy, that, uh, that I'm told is, is the cost of regulation. I, I've read a lot of of uh, condemnation of that uh, figure here. Is that a Republican think tank that posted that $1.75 trillion as the, as the cost of current regulation? Where did, we, where did we find that figure? You're referring to the Crane and Crane study, I Congressman. Am. If you'll give me 30 seconds. It was commissioned by the Small Business Administration, Mr. Mr. Congressman. I can tell you that I have not um, read it. Um, my focus when these issues came before Judiciary and Oversight, um, if, you look at the, if you look at certain of the provisions in 3010, like the right to cross-examine, something as systemic and fundamental in this country, I have watched kids be cross-examined. I have watched battered spouses be cross-examined, all because we believe that is the best way to elicit the truth. And yet we can't have cross-examination when you're dealing with regulations that can put a company out of business. The minority witness, I couldn't believe I heard it, so I had to get him to repeat it. We shouldn't have any cross-examination on scientific matters. Let that sink in for a moment. No cross-examination on scientific matters. The congressman from Georgia has put his finger on it. There's not a soul I've met in this body that does not believe in regulation. There's not a soul I've met that's not even willing to flip it to a benefit-cost analysis, put the benefit up front and the cost secondary. But we have both seen regulations promulgated in our brief time here that have nothing to do with the safety, security, and health of the American worker. And I can cite some examples of it. So whether it is providing for cross-examination, whether it's a codification of the benefit-cost analysis, which has been in every executive order since 1981, and all this bill seeks to do is codify it, where it, we're no longer relying upon an executive order that doesn't have the force of law, a, a providing advance notice for a major rule that's going to impact an industry, I, uh, those are eminently reasonable. It, it, the stunning part is not that we're putting this in a bill. The stunning part is that it hasn't been done already. That's exactly right. And I appreciate you pointing that, uh, pointing that out. I, I think there's lots of blame to go around in Republican and Democratic Congresses who have not played that constitutional role of being the check and the balance 
uh, on what goes on at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, that it's important to America, irrespective of who sits in that house, uh, that folks uh, perform their constitutional duty uh, here, on, here on Capitol Hill. And, and, it, and whether it's a, a Republican president in 2013 uh, or a Democratic uh, president, we have the same uh, mandate uh, to make sure that executive orders do not take the place of what the people's house uh, should, be, uh, should be legislating. The, Mr. Cohen, let me ask you $1.75 trillion, not, not my numbers, the cost of, of, of regulatory um, burdens, but the, the number that the Small Business Administration is, is publishing. I understand that you think that number is a little, a little high. If it were $1.5 trillion, would that be a large enough number to suggest that we should begin doing more of the cost-benefit uh, analysis, or is, or is that not? You know, sir, I just know that CRS said that, in essence, there were more, so many holes in that report that it made Swiss cheese look like hard cheddar. So let's say it was, let's say it was off by, by, by a factor of one, that it was 100 percent uh, too high. Would, um, would uh, $800 billion a year in, in, in regulatory burdens, would that be enough to, to matter? What is it, $800 billion is 1 percent? I lost your math. They, uh, you say 1.75 trillion is is, right. is is way off. It's way so off. I, let's cut it in half. Let, let's say it's. Well, that's it, not one percent. Factor of oh, I mean, factor I mean, of one. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Say it's 800 billion. Is is 800 billion? I mean, that was the that was the the cost of the president's stimulus package uh, over over an entire multi-year time frame. We're talking about uh, what if we could reclaim 800 billion in. In productivity in, in one year, would that number be large enough to if, matter? If, I guess if it could, you'd look at it and have to balance it. But I don't. I think that's way out of line too. And, and I'm happy you brought up the the, 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 the American Recovery Investment Act because that did put three million people back to work: firemen, policemen, and teachers who we need and we need desperately today. Well, I guess my great frustration with that is I thought it was going to put more people back to work. And my understanding is so much of that money still hasn't gone out the door because folks are rate waiting on regulatory uh, approvals uh, to get it out. But the it door. did build I'm, your roads and your community, and it helped build your bridges, and it helped with the airports and the runways and all those things that are important. And I'm a those huge supporter jobs. of the of the transportation infrastructure plan. I I think it is shameful that we don't have uh, a six-year transportation uh, bill out there. Shameful we didn't get one last year. Shameful we didn't get one the year before that. And going to be shameful if we don't get one uh, this year. I think we absolutely uh, owe that to the, uh, the American people. But I think you hit it right on the nose, Mr. Cohen, when you said if it was $800 billion, whether or not that was large enough or not, we just need to balance. Uh, I think that's all that, that this bill is, is asking for. And I would say to you that that uh, if you don't think we've captured balance in this bill, uh, I would hope that you would agree with me that it is balance that we are seeking. Uh, and I will certainly uh, be uh, encouraging uh, uh, folks to, to make in order whatever amendments uh, we can to try to make sure that we find that balance, because I think that's what the American people want. And I think that's all uh, that they want, balance in what we do here uh, in Washington. I thank the chairman for the thank time. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, my distinguished colleague and friend from Georgia points out uh, something to me that's pretty obvious, and that is uh, that you, you, you say, uh, Mr. Woodall, that we would make the amendments that we can. So I'm just quoting you now from what you just said. Um, we could make this an open rule and let all of uh, uh, the House uh, speak to the issue and put it on the floor. But the question that I have for the gentlemen uh, who have presented is what happened in committee in your markup? Um, did it, as in most committees, and I might add in both Democratic and Republican majorities, uh, did any Democratic amendment survive the markup? Uh, Congressman, I honestly cannot recall. When you get to be my age, you will find that things kind of run together, and there's a big blur. Uh, we mark up so many bills at the same time, I would have to defer to Mr. Cohen as to whether or not anything, uh, any Democrat amendments were accepted. I know some have been on some recent bills, but I can't mm -hmm. swear to this one. Uh, Gentlemen, yield. Sure. Uh, to answer that question, in every member's packet, there is a summary or should be a committee on rules bill summary 
-hmm. And on page uh, three, there is a list of the controversial controversies and amendments with those uh, listed therein. So if I could please refer this. But, to the but does, that, does that answer the question whether any Democratic amendment survived the marker? I think there was one technical amendment that, that was Well, then, doubtless, we will have an opportunity here to make uh, the Democratic amendments that are being sought um, in order at least to assist in uh, the measure. I also want to address uh, a period of time in our history uh, when we had unfettered regulation um, in one segment of um, our economy, and that was um, in the securities um, uh, area. Um, and I think that that was a major contributor to many of the problems uh, that we have in our society today. Um, good friend of mine and Mr. Sessions and Mr. McGovern's um, went to that agency. Um, I had such great hope. I traveled to China with Chris Cox, and I thought surely we were getting ready to really do something. And we didn't do nothing. And what we got was a whole bunch of junk bonds and swaps and all kinds of things that we can't even untangle because we don't really um, uh, have the uh, way of going about it uh, that would cause us to be able to untangle it. I do want to remind members that Congress has the first and the last say uh, with reference to regulatory matters. And we have uh, sufficient oversight, it would seem to me, not to want to strangulate um, our regulation. I agree with everybody that our regulation should um, uh, uh, be um, uh, the kind of um, uh, undertaking that allows for reasonableness. There's nobody here, I believe, that wants us to have bad air, bad water, bad food. Uh, I just simply uh, don't believe that. But I do know that if certain entities are not regulated, that what we wind up with uh, in some instances is bad air, bad food, and bad water. And that just, to my way of thinking, um, uh, requires uh, Congress to do more um, uh, than bureaucracies. I believe that we should. Um, I do want to debunk uh, the Crane report. Um, I haven't read that entire report, but I keep hearing it cited um, uh, by our colleagues on the floor and here in this uh, committee. Um, uh, the portion of it that I did look at, uh, and I'd ask the two presenters whether they um, uh, read into the Crane report um, uh, that they looked at the benefits um, uh, side of, uh, of the equation, or did they rely most on uh, costs uh, in their analysis? Do either of you, have either of you paid attention to that report? I don't believe benefits was even a part of their report. Then is that fair? Well, I don't think it is. O OMB has said for all the administrations from Clinton forward that benefits have out always outweighed costs. Even and, and, and during the Bush administration, there were more rules promulgated uh, by far than uh, even on a proportional basis than during the Obama administration, and yet no, these you, rules weren't raised. You, you wish to respond, sir? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Congressman. No, I just was asking, did you uh, wish to respond? I thought you were getting ready to, and I didn't want to cut you off. Well, uh, thank you for that. Um, I. I have tried very hard not to make reference to that study because I can't uh, I can't testify to the efficacy of it. I understand. I can tell you this: uh, Kaz Sunstein, who is a uh, regulatory czar, uh, is the author of this comment: "To promote growth, innovation, and job creation, we must take aggressive steps to eliminate unjustified regulatory burdens, especially in today's economic environment." The president himself said overregulation has stifled innovation and has had a chilling effect on growth and jobs. If these weren't issues, I don't believe the president and and Mr. Sun, Professor Sunstein would be making reference to overregulation. So it, it, there has to be an issue with it. I don't think that they're fighting paper tigers. I, I've intentionally not made reference to that study because I can't I can't tell you whether it's uh, whether it's accurate or not. I can tell you anecdotally. 
Congressman, when I go back to South Carolina, uh, regulatory uncertainty. When I, when I go to a chemical plant and the same eight by eight foot concrete building is tested and examined by three different federal government entities, uh, there is frustration and uncertainty that I think does stifle job creation. You know, the other thing that uh, we tend to ignore is that municipalities and counties and states also have regulatory requirements. And when we speak to issues, it's almost as if it's always federal. And I find it strange um, uh, that the really what looks like innocuous requirements in this measure are going to uh, create a real tangle of red tape. And that's basically what we're trying to um, uh, say, that, you know, we, 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 ju we just can't have a, a, a situation where many of the things that all of us know um, uh, that regulatory uh, measures have uh, helped our society. And I don't, for the life of me, see how uh, tying up um, regulatory agencies um, is going to fulfill um, uh, the intent of uh, the bill as you have uh, set it forth. I respect uh, the fact that we're having the discussion, and I hope all of the amendments that are being sought uh, uh, here will be made in order, and more importantly, that we have an open rule. I uh, thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you, Mr. Hastings. Mr. Nugent? No questions, Mr. Polis? In deference to the other members who want to be heard who are, have been patiently waiting, I'll yield back my time to the Chair. Mr. Scott? Ms. Webster? Thank you very much. I want to thank both of you for your testimony today and uh, for sticking around for questions. I do recognize that at least one of you has uh, another appearance that you've got to make, and so as a result of us having an opportunity to hear your testimony and ask questions, I will let both of you uh, go ahead and leave at this time, and I would uh, ask the gentlewoman, you're, you're excused. Uh, gentlewoman... Uh, from Texas is recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your courtesies and uh, thank the Rules Committee for their courtesies. Um, members enjoy this discussion. I thank you for your provative questions. I'll try to make very succinct points on uh, both uh, 527 uh, and 3010. Uh, first, I'd like to just acknowledge on the due process question and my concern about these, these bills coming from judiciary is that the Administrative Procedure Code which uh, Act, which governs uh, the regulatory process, uh, does allow um, the uh, opportunity for those who oppose regulations uh, to seek relief in the federal courts under the Due Process and Fifth Amendment. So I don't want to think that blanket um, a lack of opportunity and that these um, uh, particular legislative initiatives are the only opportunity for uh, those uh, who have opposition to do so. The other point that I'd like to make is that um, we don't know, we can't quantify how much money uh, will be lost or maybe how much money uh, will be gained by these regulations. I think regulations are based upon the safety and security of the American people. But if we can take any comfort in this economy, I guess we can take it uh, in the $52 billion that was spent by Americans on Black Friday. Um, some believe that we're moving in the right direction. My amendments speak to that. One um, in 527 uh, is simply to uh, ask, and I'll just make the point, is to indicate that we do need to assess the cost of this particular legislation. And I would join my colleague, Mr. Hastings, and ask for uh, an open rule. And I'll quickly move past 527. The amendment I have introduced is for a GAO study uh, to determine uh, whether or not uh, we could, in fact, um, save any money or whether this will add uh, to the cost of doing business, which all of us uh, would like uh, not to occur. Uh, the, uh, and I, I'm not going haphazard, but I want to make mention of um, the uh, amendment uh, regarding notice. Uh, which is uh, Amendment Number 3, H.R. 3010, uh, and I would say to you that it takes that notice requirement and puts it back in the discretion of the agency because, frankly, I think we might agree uh, that that provision might, in fact, slow regulations that would be bipartisan, 
uh, would be maybe supportive of Republicans. Uh, and frankly, I'm fair. I believe that if a regulation comes out, I have many ways of challenging it. So do those who oppose it. They've had a, a register uh, comment time, but to give advance notice may be a challenging time. So I want to go to two amendments dealing with Homeland Security and just give this uh, anecdotal story in conclusion uh, to, uh, to the amendments. And that is for 3010 uh, and for uh, 527. I have uh, amendments uh, that says, or an amendment in both of these that says that if it deals with Homeland Security, we waive the regulatory scheme of both of these bills. I say that as a member of the Homeland Security Committee since its creation, tragically, after the heinous and horrific attack on the American people. But, Mr. Chairman, I also say that in the backdrop of a very tragic, unfortunate incident, there are two sides to the story, of the loss of 25 Pakistani soldiers in the last three to four days. Why do, why do I say that? All the chatter has been uh, about uh, the relationship and, and how, do we, uh, how do we know what happened. But I say to you that what we have gleaned, and this is not classified, I think all of us know that terrorism is now franchised. If we had to poll the Pakistani people, uh, we know that we are not the most popular uh, people uh, in the world. How does that provoke individualized acts of terror, whether or not it is the Times Square bomber, uh, whether or not it is training in Yemen? Uh, we know that these kinds of elements are here to do harm to the American people. I frankly believe, as a member of the Homeland Security Committee, to put Homeland Security regulations through this kind of extensive process and all of these bills um, will, uh, in essence, uh, dumb down uh, the flexibility, the crisis um, ability to respond to crisis, uh, to deal with securing the homeland. And the regulatory process that America has put in place is simply to of no matter what party you're in, is to ensure the safety and security of the American people. Safety, food safety, uh, safety dealing with uh, travel, um, uh, safety dealing with food. Uh, so many of us are aware of the unfortunate circumstances that have helped, uh, happened with food poisoning, whether it's a hamburger, I don't want to get the hamburger people on me, uh, whether or not it's fruit, uh, we all realize that. So I would argue that what I see, um, both on the horizon and what I've seen as a member of the Homeland Security Committee, that I'd ask that this amendment be made in order dealing with waiving regulations, dealing with the securing of the homeland. And I thank the committee uh, for its indulgence. Thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman uh, Jackson Lee, for your testimony. Does anyone on this committee have any questions of the gentlewoman? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the gentlewoman is excused. Thank you. Uh, there being no further witnesses for H.R. 527 and H.R. 3010, this portion of the hearing is now closed, and we now would like to welcome uh, Mr. Harper and Mr. Brady to come forth uh, representing the House Administration uh, for their testimony on H.R. 3463, and without objections, your statements uh, will be included in the record. And Mr. Harper, welcome to the committee. Gentlemen, recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Slaughter, members of the committee. Uh, H.R. 3463 cuts unnecessary spending in two ways. First, it ends the taxpayer financing of presidential election campaigns and party conventions, a program diminishing in popularity for both taxpayers and candidates. Second, it terminates the Election Assistance Commission, an obsolete government agency. Since 1976, American taxpayers have spent approximately $1.5 billion funding presidential primary campaigns, presidential general, camp general election campaigns, and national party conventions. Contrary to its original intent, the program has not improved the honesty or civility in presidential campaigns, nor has it been overflowing with candidates willing to participate. In fact, we find that more and more candidates are opting out of the system altogether. And it's not just candidates that don't like it. Since 1980, the percentage of taxpayers opting to participate has declined from 28.7% to 7%. Uh, that means that 93% of American taxpayers choose not to participate in this program. Mr. Chairman, eliminating this system will save taxpayers an estimated $447 million over five years and return nearly $199 million to the Treasury now. This is sensible and long overdue. Also long overdue is the elimination or termination of the Election Assistance Commission. 
the EAC created in 2002 was expected to sunset in 2005. Instead, despite its dwindling services, this agency has more than doubled in size in the last three years and now spends over 50 percent of its budget on administration and overhead cost. It was established to allocate general or to federal grants for state voting system upgrades, uh, upgrades to conduct research and to test and certify voting equipment. Aside from the certification services, which can be carried out by the Federal Election Commission, the EAC has fulfilled its purpose. According to the CBO, dissolving the agency will save taxpayers $33 million over the next five years. Mr. Chairman, we have a $15 trillion debt. We now have annual deficits over a million, uh, over $1 trillion each year. H.R. 3463 eliminates one government program that virtually no one uses and shuts down another agency that has completed its task. Surely this is appropriate when we say, face such a deep fiscal crisis. When you have obsolete programs without purpose, you eliminate them. Mr. Chairman, I request the Rules Committee report an appropriate rule allowing the House to consider H.R. 3463. I thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm ready to answer any questions the Committee may have. Mr. Harper, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bray, welcome to the Rules Committee. Thank you. Thank Glad you, Mr. Glad to see the former Chairman of the uh, Committee, and the gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Thank the Chairman and Ranking Member for the opportunity to testify. Earlier this year, Mr. Chairman, I sat at or offered testimony regarding H.R. 359, a bill to repeal the Presidential Election Campaign Fund. In that testimony, I may clear my opposition to consideration of that bill without any hearings or markups in either of the two committees of referral, yet the bill went to the floor anyway, where it passed, but it has since received no consideration by the Senate, it is no closer to becoming law today than it was on January 26th. I wasn't even provided the opportunity to come before you in H.R. 672, a previous version of legislation to abolish the Elections Assistance Commission, which is under the leadership of my friend Mr. Harper from Mississippi, from Mississippi who I thanked and thank now, marked up and reported to the House Administration Committee after consideration of amendments offered by the minority. However, it was rushed to the floor under suspension of the rules in a process which, considered our, which did not consider our amendments by the House and barred, and, bill, and barred the bill itself from easily defeating on a party line vote. Since failing to secure the necessary two-thirds, H.R. 672 has been also on the shelf gathering dust until today. The bill I'm here to discuss today combines these two really bad ideas. I'm asking the Rules Committee to adopt an open rule for consideration of this bill so that our members may offer common sense amendments to improve this legislation. The importance of both the EAC and the, op and the options to publicly fund presidential campaigns cannot be underst understated. In the aftermath of the Supreme Court ruling on Citizens United versus FEC, the subsequent rise of the super PAC, not since Watergate has the integrity of our elections been more in doubt. The EAC assists. They're a great source of information before the fact and not after the fact. The Presidential Election Campaign Fund is a completely voluntary program for, tax, for taxpayers. In 1974, in response to public pressure, after the Watergate scandal, Congress amended the Federal Election Campaign Act, established the presidential public financing system we have now. Opting to donate $3 to a fund has no impact on the taxpayer's tax refund or their tax liability. If a presidential candidate accepts public finance and they are bound from accepting any outside contribution, thereby precluding any attempt to influence a candidate via a donation. Interesting enough, money has already been asked for and accepted taxpayer funding for the 2002 nominating convention from the same fund that some now seek to repeal. The other question I have, if you do repeal this, there's some 19 or $20 million, depending who you talk to, that our citizens already checked off a block. That would go back to the Treasury. My constituents, your constituents, or the American people did not check off that block to put that money back into the Treasury. They already put enough money back into the Treasury and they paid their taxes. If you don't believe me, you just ask any one of them and they will tell you that. The Elections Assistant Commission arose from the 2000 electric debacle in Florida. By providing local election officials with best practices, voters, and essential information, and by ensuring the proper functions of voting machines, the EAC is the only government agency responsible for the administration of our elections. Further, the agency works to safeguard the right to vote for the military, the elderly, and those with disabilities. The agency's core mission is to maximize voter inclusion. This bill will restrict it. As I said before, I oppose these bills before, and I oppose these combined bills today. I hope that this committee will allow members to improve this legislation on the floor, and I thank you all for your time. Gentlemen, thank you much, very much for your clear testimony to both of you for being here.
Are there any questions uh, of the committee of these uh, two witnesses by the committee? Mr. Chairman, I have Mr. Woodall. just uh, just one. I, I've always liked the checkoff program because I like to be able to decide if we could have 150 items on the checkoff program, I'd tell you exactly what it is I want my taxes to, to go for. Uh, in committee, was there any suggestion for folks who believe uh, in the efficacy of this program? I do not believe in the e efficacy of the program, but Mr. Harper, was there any uh, move in the committee to make this a checkoff above and beyond one's tax liability so that the program could continue as opposed uh, to take it out of one's tax liability? That uh, would have gone through ways and means, of which I'm not on that committee, and I can't give you, a, uh, you know, an answer to that. I know it, it, um, it went to the floor without any committee hearings on it, I believe, okay. on, that, on that portion of the bill. The uh, EAC portion, of course, went through Committee on House Administration, and we did have at least um, a couple of hearings on that. And I just want to make sure I understood what you said about the EAC because I, we were talking before you all arrived about uh, uh, trying to find uh, balance and, and making sure we were taking care of the needs that need to be taken care of. This is a, this is a, a d program that did not exist prior to 2002 that Correct. was designed to sunset by 2005 but has instead doubled its uh, its budget and is now dedicating more than 50 percent of its budget to, to overhead? Almost 52 percent of it is now going to overhead. And, and in addition, the uh, National Association of Secretaries of State, which is a bipartisan group, did a resolution in 2005 saying let's end this. Uh, obviously it hadn't happened. They renewed that resolution in 2010. Uh, that is a bipartisan group calling for the end of the EAC. Uh, and there are many reasons why uh, this needs to be done. Uh, the essential functions of it, uh, which would uh, be uh, certification and testing, would, could go to the FEC, which could handle that now. This is, this is, it's time to bring this in uh, to a conclusion. We were talking earlier about thoughtful men and women who just cannot predict the, the consequences of their actions. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to, to correct those unintended consequences uh, here a decade later. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Wood. Any questions on this side? Mrs. Fox? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would just like to um, thank both the gentlemen for coming today, and I think this is a perfect example of the statement that Ronald Reagan made about uh, the closest thing to immortality on earth is a government program, and I think these programs have long uh, passed their uh, effectiveness, and I think this is what makes the American people so angry about the Congress and why we have such a poor rating is that even in the light of uh, half of the money being spent on administration, programs should have been sunset. In light of all common sense that it is so difficult to get some people to vote to undo a program. People wonder why the super committee had such difficulty with coming up with a trillion dollars, $1.2 trillion worth of cuts. And when you see, again, people voting against this action, you can understand why uh, people have such a low opinion of the Congress. And I, I thank the gentleman for being here. Gentlemen, you'll thank you, Ms. Fox. Uh, gentleman, Drucker. Yeah, I, I just want to make a comment. Um, you know, I, I think the American people are getting sick of Congress, too, and in, in large part because they think that we're – Totally, I, I think small. I think we just dropped below smallpox. Sir. Yeah, right, right. To, um, but I think people. I think people are frustrated. They think that that Congress is subservient to big corporations. And one of the things that I, I worry about is, is in terminating the ta uh, taxpayer financing of pres presidential election campaigns. And I realize that candidates aren't taking advantage of it because there's so much money available. I mean, the money that goes into these campaigns is grotesque. And what we should be doing is not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but figuring out how to reform these programs, you know, to tighten up our system so it is not almost wholly based on money. Whoever raises the most money wins. That's not the way it should be. And, um, and again, I, 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 I sometimes think that all this money that, come, that goes into these campaigns reflect what the priorities are on the floor of this Congress. So I, um, you know, I, I think there's a frustration out there that people feel powerless. Uh, that they feel that uh, because if you don't have money, then you don't have influence in the system. And I think that, that's where the frustration is. And so I, I thank you both for being here. But I, I, 
really, on, on something like this, I think we should be talking about how do we reform our system so it is not so much money-based uh, and there's not so much special interest influence. I don't care from where, but, you know, it's too much money in politics. I appreciate you being here. Thank you very Mr. much. Mr. Chairman, uh, could I make one more recognized. quick comment? Um, I find it interesting that our colleague from Massachusetts would bring this issue up since it's his party and the representative of his party who raised so much money and who said he didn't want to participate and first said he was going to participate in the program and then decided not to participate in the program because he raised so much money from special interest groups that he didn't need to participate in this program and that it is his party that raises so much money from Wall Street and from special interest groups. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Fox. Uh, seeing no further questions, uh, and the chairman recognizing he sees no member who would be seeking recognition, there is uh, there being no more witnesses, I would excuse the gentlemen who are here. Thank you very much for being with us. Without objection, the hearing portion of this meeting is now closed, and the chair will be in the receipt of a motion offered by the gentlewoman, Ms. Fox. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 3463 to reduce federal spending in the deficit by terminating taxpayer financing of presidential election campaigns and party conventions and by terminating the Election Assistance Commission, a closed rule. The rule provides one hour debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on House Administration. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill and provides that it shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill. The rule provides one motion to recommit. The rule further provides for consideration of H.R. 527, the Regulatory Flexibility Act, under a structured rule. The rule provides one hour of general debate with 40 minutes equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking member of the Committee on the Judiciary, and 20 minutes equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Small Business. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule makes an order as original text for the purpose of amendment. The Rules Committee print dated November 18, 2011, and provides that the print shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against the Rules Committee print. The rule makes an order only those amendments to H.R. 527 printed in Part A of the Rules Committee report. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment, and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. All points of order against the amendments printed in Part A of the Rules Committee report are waived. The rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. The resolution also provides for consideration of H.R. 3010, the Regulatory Accountability Act of 2011, under a structured rule. The rule provides one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on the judiciary. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that the amendment in the nature of a substitute recommended by the committee on the judiciary now printed in the bill shall be considered as original text for the purpose of amendment and shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against the committee amendment in the nature of a substitute. The rule makes an order only those amendments to H.R. 3010 printed in Part B of the Rules Committee report. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment, shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. All points of order against the amendments printed in Part B of the Rules Committee report are waived. The rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Finally, the rule authorizes the Speaker to entertain motions that the House suspend the rules at any time through the legislative day of December 2, 2011, relating to a measure addressing railway labor. You've heard the motion. Is there a discussion or any other amendments? Yes. 
Mr. Chairman, I move that the I move that the committee report an open rule for consideration of HR 527, HR 3010, and HR 3463, so that all members have the opportunity to offer amendments to these bills. You've heard the amendment by uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. I ask for. No. Ask for uh, the amendment is not agreed to. I ask for a roll call vote. Uh, clerk will report. For roll call. Ms. Fox. No. Ms. Fox, no. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop, no. Mr. Woodall. No. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Nugent. No. Mr. Nugent, no. Mr. Scott. <laughs> Mr. Scott, no. Mr. Webster. No. Mr. Webster, no. Ms. Slaughter. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Polis. Aye. Polis, aye. Mr. Dreyer. Mr. Sessions. Mr. No. Chairman. Clerk will report the totals. Three yeas, seven nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Any further amendments? Gentlemen, Mr. McGovern. Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee make an order and provide any necessary waivers for my amendment number one to H.R. 3463, a substitute amendment which would end taxpayer subsidies to oil companies. And if I could just speak for a minute, Mr. Chairman, I would. I was recognized. I thank the, the Chairman. Um, I want to remind my colleagues that six big oil companies piled up $32.6 billion in profits over the third quarter of 2011, pushing their good fortunes for the year over $101 billion. Um, oil has climbed during October from $77.61 per barrel to $93.17 per barrel. ExxonMobil made $10.3 billion, Chevron $7.8 billion, Shell $7.7 zero billion dollars and ConocoPhillips 2.6 billion dollars. Um, BP reported hefty earnings of 4.9 billion dollars. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have, um, I have offered similar amendments ending oil and gas subsidies uh, to several different bills, including an appropriations bill, an energy bill, uh, and, to, and to a tax bill. And uh, my friends in the majority have voted against this amendment every time uh, that it's been, off it's been, off it's been offered. Uh, I would simply say that the pay-fors in the bill that you are presenting before us today are really unrelated to the substance of the bill. Uh, and so I hope that the, the gentleman won't hide behind germane uh, issues, uh, issues as, a, as a justification not making my amendment in order. Um, you waive all points of order on a regular basis and waive germane rules when it fits your uh, political agenda, and I would hope that out of fairness that uh, I would have this opportunity again. It's, uh, I've been, tr I'm been trying and trying and trying to get this thing to the floor, and my hope is that maybe this is the time that I could have this uh, this vote, and I would urge my colleagues to support my amendment. Gentlemen, the amendment has now been discussed. Any further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's recognized. They, I just want to say to my friend, every time he brings up his amendment and every time I vote no on his amendment, I tell the gentleman I'm very much in favor of your amendment. Of all those times you've listed that you've offered it, you're right. You have not offered it when it was germane once. Not once. And I say to the gentleman because I, I don't question his sincerity, but I, too, have legislation that would abolish every loophole, deduction, tax exemption, special lobbyist carve out across the board because I wager that if we look for folks who make billions of dollars in profits, it's not going to end at the oil companies. If this behavior is offensive, it is not offensive because these people provide American energy. It's offensive because people who have money don't need a free ride on the back of other American taxpayers. And I would encourage my friend, as I will vote no on this non-germane amendment again today, uh, I would urge my friend, uh, if he's sincere about, uh, about uh, having this pass the floor of the House, and I know that he is, uh, to join with us on this side of the aisle, because I too am sincere about having something like this pass the floor of the House. And I believe working together we can, can be successful. And we won't have to add it as an amendment. We can make it the issue. Uh, and then Germaine, this absolutely won't be a, a, an issue, and I, I thank the chair for well, you. Uh, and I, the discussion. Yeah, I, Mr. I, Chairman. The gentleman's recognized. Oh. Well, I'll, I'll let, I'll let go, the gentleman go for us, because I'm sure I'll have to respond to her, so I, I'll let her go. I, I yield to the gentleman from Massachusetts so he could respond to the No, I would just say there's something wrong with this process when, you know, here we are uh, approaching December, um, and, I can't, and, there's, and, we, we, and, and we're using – Germanist rules to justify why we can't go after uh, taxpayer subsidies for big oil companies. 
Uh, the fact of the matter is, I, mean, I, I think people are outraged. I don't care where they live that, uh, that you, have, you have companies that are making this kind of profit and taxpayers are subsidizing it. At the same time, you're telling people that we have to cut back on monies for teachers and monies for police and monies for LIHEAP. I mean, I, I have people that can't afford the, uh, to pay their energy uh, in the winter months, and we're cutting back on the program that gives them the opportunity to do that. All I'm simply saying, we, we can I mean, this is the Rules Committee. You can do whatever you want. You can attach the front of a Volkswagen to the back of a Cadillac. Listen, you can do anything in this committee. And rules have been waived time and time again by my friends on the other side of the aisle. So I just don't think that that's a very good excuse at this late stage after these many tries to say I, I can't have this opportunity. So, uh, you know, it is what it is, and uh, people will vote the way they vote. But... Uh, I'm going to insist on a, on a recorded vote, but I guess Dr. Fox has a few things. Mr. Appreciate the gentleman's Mr. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, Ms. I'm Fox, sorry. did you have further? I did, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'll be short so that my colleague from Utah can speak. I, I was uh, only on this committee for two years when the gentleman and his colleagues were in the majority in the Congress, but you all were in the majority for four years. For two of those years, you had the president also, so you, so you had the, um, the president in office, the Democratic president, you had Democrat control of the Congress. I do not remember ever having a vote on ending taxpayer subsidies for big oil companies during that period of time. Well, we'll give you the chance now. Well, I keep hearing the, the gentleman from Massachusetts saying, why don't we do this, why don't we do that? And I just want to remind the gentleman. Well, I will, if you, generally, Lee, I want to correct. Let, if I'll finish, okay. then then you can talk. That you all were in charge again for four years of the Congress. Two of those years, you also had the presidency, and you didn't. You you said you were trying to do things to um, create jobs. We predicted everything that you did was going to de was going to destroy jobs. You brought that up earlier, but again. When you were in the majority, you didn't offer these kinds yes, of amendments. Did. Yes. You didn't offer to do the things that you're now doing in the minority. And so I find it very curious that during that period of time, when you had the votes to do, as you say, anything the Rules Committee wanted to do, you had super majorities in the Senate, super majorities in the House, that you did not do the things that you challenge us to do all the time. Well, if the gentlelady will yield, I will tell the gentlelady we did ha we did have votes um, on on this issue. It did, unfortunately, it did not make it to the president's desk. I'll get her a list of those votes so to refresh her memory. But the bottom line is, here we are today, and you know, and uh, we can argue about who's responsible for the lousy economy, and we, and we go on for that forever and ever and ever and ever. I will just remind the gentlelady that the president inherited the worst economy since the Great Depression, for the record. But you know, we could. We, we could have that argument until the cows come home. Fact of the matter is, you know, with the budget being in the difficult situation it is in now, and people are being asked to sacrifice, you know, your people talk about cutting all, uh, all kinds of programs that would impact the quality of life for people. I think it's outrageous the American taxpayers continue to subsidize big oil. Now, maybe there's a reason for that, and if there is, fine, you know, people can d debate it and have an up or down vote, but I, again, I've you know, you got a bill before us here that waives all points of order against the against provisions of this bill, waives all points of order against consideration of the bill, waives all points of order against the Rules Committee print of H.R. 527 dated November 18, 2011. You waive all points of order over and over and over again. So don't don't hide behind the germaneness issue as a justification to not bring this to the floor. And I'll get the gentlelady a list of the times that we, we had. We appreciate the gentleman, and I think it would be a, a good thing for us all to, as the gentleman suggests, to refresh our memory on these Happy issues. Sir. And I thank the gentleman, uh, Mr. Bishop. Um, first of all, I have to take issue with what Ms. Fox said. I, I think the majorities of the past couple of sessions were not super. Were not super. <laughs> Mediocre to average, but definitely they were not super. Um, I do have a question of semantics I'd like to ask Mr. Woodall, if it were possible, if he would yield. Sir. I was intrigued when you went over the issues, the, the words you used as to what you would like to do to try and simplify the tax system. You talked about doing away with credits, deductions, carve-outs, 
You did not use the word subsidy. Now, if would you correct me if I'm wrong? Is the word subsidy meaning when the government pays an entity something directly? Well, the general yield, I, I think that's that's right. Any direct payment from the government to an entity uh, would be a would be a subsidy. I want a much broader list of things I'd like to do away with. So, when you were talking in your potential bill about carving out deductions and credits, that's not the same thing as a subsidy. We would be very hard to find direct subsidies, but you could find a lot of tax credits and tax deductions. I guess when I deduct my mortgage on my tax form, I don't really consider that to be a subsidy. But I think in the vernacular that we are throwing around here very inaccurately, we throw the word subsidy around when it has a specific meaning. And I don't think the specific meaning is, I'm glad what you were doing with that. And I, look, we're, we've been off topic for quite a while so far. So if I was, you know, one of the occupiers, I'd do point of order and we'd move on with the well, vote. I'm ready. If, if, I could, if I could just, I mean, is the gentleman saying that the oil, oil companies are not receiving any monies from the government? And as Dr. Fox points out, the government is the people. Uh, I mean, I mean, taxpayers are, are contributing greatly. Uh, to underwriting some of the, uh, the operations of, of big oil companies, and, 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 and at a time when they're making record profits and they're raising their prices and they're ripping people off, so I think it's wrong. Is saying that they're taking and tax I'm saying that they're, they're, ta they're taking taxpayer dollars. Yeah. Well, I say ta taxpayer. Do well, taxpayer dollars. Then I, I would. Then we'll use taxpayer dollars. The chair recognizes the uh, important Excuse discussion me. that's taking place. Yes. Gentlemen, Mr. Hastings. Yes, thank you, Chairman. You I have time. yet another amendment. And well, I'm Mr. Uh, Hastings, if you'll allow me to dispose of the gentleman's amendment, amendment. first, then I will get to you. Absolutely. With that said, I think the point's well made. We're now on votes, and the, the chair would like to uh, advise all members that I'd like to move as expeditiously as we can through this so that we do not have to come back after votes. Thank you very much. The vote now is on the uh, McGovern Amendment. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those no? No. Ask for roll call. Um, does not pass. Gentlemen, ask for roll call vote. The uh, clerk will uh, ask for roll call. Ms. Fox? No. Ms. Fox? No. Mr. Bishop? No. Mr. Bishop? No. Mr. Woodall? No. Mr. Woodall? No. Mr. Nugent? No. Mr. Nugent? No. Mr. Scott? No. Mr. Scott? No. Mr. Webster? No. Mr. Webster? No. Ms. Slaughter? Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Polis, aye. Mr. Polis, aye. Mr. Dreyer, Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report. Three yeas, seven nays. Not agreed to. Other amendments? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Recognized. Before that, I'd like to just correct. I believe I would be correcting the record when I say um, to my good friend from North Carolina uh, that. When the Democrats were in the majority in the House, the Senate, and the presidency, there was no, not Mr. Bishop's uh, way of putting it, there was no supermajority in the U.S. Senate. Um, it's 60. I believe there were 60 at one time, which is generally called uh, the supermajority. During that same period of time? Yes, sir. I like that. I, I stand corrected. I just... Um, then we did do some pretty super things, and I well, disagree with Mr. Will the, will the gentleman yield? Of course. There are actually, uh, I believe, two independent senators uh, that were not, yes, they were not Democrats, uh, and so there were, I believe, 58 Democrats at the height in the Senate. And, and to further that, all of this talk that we do in the House of, the Rep House of Representatives needs to be taken into consideration with regard to the United States Senate. And I say that for the reason that Republicans and Democrats have used the United States Senate uh, to whatever they uh, determine over there in that uh, other body um, uh, uh, to be um, uh, uh, the kind of undertakings that cause either the Republican House uh, majority or the Democratic House majority in the nearly 20 years that I'm here to not be able to do much of anything because Senator X or Senator Y, be he Democrat or she Republican, or determines that they don't want it to happen for the good of the nation or until they get their little whatever their, their it is that they are about. The Senate is a part of the problem, and those of us in the House need to begin to identify it. Mr. Tracy, thank you very much. Uh, the Mr. Chairman, Chairman, I have an amendment to, to the rule. Amendment. 
I have an amendment to the rule. I move the committee make an order and give the necessary waivers uh, for the amendment to H.R. 3010 uh, by Mr. Johnson of Georgia, his uh, number seven, which would create an exemption for any rule or guidance that would result in a net job creation. And very briefly, Mr. Chairman, right now Congress, as Mr. McGovern and uh, Mr. Polis and I and others have pointed out, should be focused like a laser on jobs. All the Johnson Amendment says is if the experts conclude a rule would result in net job creation, the rule shouldn't be delayed and blocked by all the stuff in this bill because we need jobs now. And what's wrong with that? Mr. Gentleman, seek a vote on his amendment. When you call the vote, Mr. Chairman, yes. All those in favor of the Hastings Amendment will say aye. Aye. Any opposed, no. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a recorder. Does not pass. The uh, gentleman asked for a roll call vote. Clerk will uh, ask, seek uh, that roll call vote. Ms. Fox? No. Ms. Fox? No. Mr. Bishop? No. Mr. Bishop? No. Mr. Woodall? No. Mr. Woodall? No. Mr. Nugent? Mr. Nugent? No. Mr. Scott? No. Mr. Scott? No. Mr. Webster? No. Mr. Webster? No. Ms. Slaughter? Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. Hastings? Aye. Mr. Hastings? Aye. Mr. Polis? Aye. Polis, aye. Mr. Dreyer, Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Four. Three yeas, seven nays. Further amendments? Mr. Chairman, no, but yet another correction on this supermajority business. My understanding of supermajority is it takes two-thirds. And I don't believe at any time uh, that the Senate was controlled by either party. Uh, since I'm here with the two-thirds. I, I, I appreciate and respect uh, the uh, gentleman's uh, viewpoint of the uh, term supermajority, uh, and I think that uh, the term that was used by Mrs. Fox was uh, attempted to uh, denote a 60-person voting block, and I do appreciate the gentleman. Are there further amendments? Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Gentleman's recognized. Thank you very much for um, explaining that for me, and you're absolutely correct. I appreciated the comments that Mr. Bishop said, and I think uh, if we can all uh, work on using appropriate language in here, such as uh, tax breaks and subsidies. I will promise to work on uh, using more accurate language if our colleagues across the aisle would do that also. So I'll commit to that, Mr. Hastings, and I appreciate your bringing it up. And I also appreciate your bringing up the situation with the Senate. I refrained from speaking about that when Mr. McGovern was speaking earlier but I was going to point out that we've passed a lot of bills from the House that would be creating jobs, but however, they're going nowhere in the Democrat-controlled Senate. Appreciate the uh, words from the uh, committee on this issue. Uh, the question is now on the motion offered by the gentlewoman from North Carolina. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. Aye. The uh, ayes have it. Uh, we will have roll call. Clerk will uh, seek roll call vote. Ms. Fox. Aye. Ms. Fox, aye. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Nugent. Aye. Mr. Nugent, aye. Mr. Scott. Aye. Scott, aye. Mr. Webster. Mr. Webster, aye. Ms. Slaughter. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. McGovern, no. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Hastings, no. Mr. Polis. No. Mr. Polis, no. Mr. Dreyer. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Clerk will report. Seven yeas, three nays. The opinion of the chair of these ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. I would remind members that we're now on a vote, uh, and thus I am closing this uh, markup. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the uh, rule was expected to anticipate uh, further action that might be necessary, uh, and I am... I'm hearing that we'll meet at 3 o'clock on Thursday uh, for the committee. Gentlemen. I am sorry. Thank you very much. The gentleman, Mr. Woodall, will be handling this for the majority and the... Mr. McGovern. Mr. McGovern will be handling it for the minority. Thank you very much. Uh, hearings now adjourned.